economic prospects of the most vulnerable. Uh, this, this panel is going to be moderated by uh, Greg Glaude. He's a manager of state initiatives for Right on Crime and a senior policy analyst at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We have Arthur Reiser. Uh, he's the criminal justice policy director and a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, where he heads work related to crime, corrections, and policing. And he is himself actually a former member of law enforcement. That's right. Okay, uh, we've got State Senator Connie Burton, a Republican from the 10th District in Texas. In 2015, in her first legislative session, she played an important role in crafting a bipartisan package of criminal justice legislation to protect the constitutional rights of all Texans. She is also a dedicated proponent of civil asset forfeiture reform. Yeah. <laughs> We have Malcolm Glenn, who is a public policy manager at Uber, where he focuses on community engagement in underserved communities. And since joining Uber in 2015, Malcolm has spearheaded the company's outreach initiatives around increasing opportunities for drivers with certain criminal records, expanding transportation options into areas that have traditionally had limited service, and uh, increasing the accessibility of the Uber app and platform to people with disabilities. We also have Teresa Hodge, who's a co-founder of Mission Launch Inc., a nonprofit focused on, yeah. <laughs> she hasn't even said anything. That's remarkable. <laughs> um, so uh, a nonprofit focused on introducing technology and entrepreneurship to previously incarcerated individuals as a way of ensuring self-sufficiency. Now, she founded Mission Launch, Inc. after her own experience in the federal prison system. Uh, additionally, Teresa manages the Rebuilding Reentry Coalition, a citizen-led movement committed to creating a more just and inclusive society for returning citizens. And I like how you put that. That's really good. And then finally, we have uh, Bill Cobb. He's the deputy director of the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice. Uh, Bill has his own story of incarceration and has gone on to do great work partnering with many others who are uh, in the process of finding redemption. So with that, Greg, I will turn it over to you. Thank you all for coming here. I, uh, I know we, I think we had about a 475 RSVPs and if we still had Uber in Austin, maybe a few more could be able to attend, so yeah. So if anyone from the city council is uh, listening, yeah. Let's go with that. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it's been great PR for you. The two, the two apps that actually are in Austin now both shut down last night over overflow. So it's been a, it's been a good PR weekend. And today too, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so fingers crossed at some point. Um, well, great, thank you again for coming here. Um, I think this is a topic that doesn't really get discussed a lot. There's been a lot of talk about expunctions and record sealing. A lot of the work that I do across the country is dealing with kind of reentry and those types of bills and legislation, but they're not worth the piece of paper they're written on if there's inaccurate information uh, put out there. Um, if you have something sealed and then there's still, you know, backgroundcheck.com still showing a conviction for you. So um, I think this is gonna be a really interesting, we're really gonna get in the weeds here. And so, Professor Reiser, I'll start with you, if you can put that cap on again. Um, it sounds like a stupid question, but what really is a background check? What does that actually entail? Kind of what's the history and how do we get where we are right now and kind of how they're performed today? Well, I mean, everything that I prepared to talk about today changed. I literally rewrote, I mean, you can see these nice type notes and then now I have this scribbly stuff of things I want to talk about. Because on Friday night, uh, my wife and I were trying to get back and we couldn't get a, one of the Fasten drivers, one of the other apps, we couldn't get somebody to come get us and so we got into a cab. And right when we got into the cab, the guy uh, said he couldn't see in order to type the address into his phone, uh, which I thought you couldn't have a driver's license if you couldn't see. But regardless, <laughs> he then drove us about a half a mile and then said he didn't know where our place was, so we needed to get out. So I used to be a cop. I was a prosecutor. I know my rights. I'm a relatively sophisticated person, so I called the police because I didn't know where I was at that point and I didn't want to get dropped off in the middle of nowhere. And so two officers came and they were awesome. Um, you can tell they did not want to be messing with this, but they spent 45 minutes of their time that they could have been doing something to protect and to serve and they spent their time messing with this cab driver who didn't want to take us back. 
And we were only four miles away. It wasn't that far. And so everything that I wanted to talk about has, has shifted. So the, the background check. I would be opposing Malcolm today if you could show me that the background check that is being imposed here in Austin made us safer, and it doesn't. So let me tell you what we're talking about. In, a, in the 30s, the FBI said, you know what, we need to keep a better database of what's going on. That's a good idea. And so they did. And that database has a lot of stuff in it. It doesn't just have arrests. It also has what's called contacts. So what's your name, sir? John. What's your name, ma'am? So if Lauren and John were pulled over, John, you were doing something super shady, but the cop couldn't pin you for it. He would make a contact card, right, Sergeant? And he would write that information down, and that information can be filtered into a database. Now, the privacy people here might be going screaming right now, but this is called, called, called good policing. And later on, if something happened to John, they can look up that information, and they're like, wait a minute, he was in a car with Lauren two weeks ago, maybe we should go talk to her. That is called good policing. The FBI background check that we're talking about is a fantastic tool for investigating crime. It is a morbid tool for vetting people for employment. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we do this is crazy, and because the word, fancy words of FBI is on it, for some reason that makes us feel safer, it doesn't make us safer. In fact, 50% of all the information by the FBI's own account, 50% of all the information in the database is inaccurate or incomplete. So Malcolm was telling the senator a story a few seconds ago about how it, that means that you can be arrested and it can prevent you from getting a job. That's terrible. But think about it the other direction. You can actually been arrested, been convicted, and that information is not in the database. It is insane that we tolerate this anywhere. And the last thing I'll leave it with, with how this system is impacting actual businesses is just the example of, of Houston and Austin. Before uh, Uber left, they had twice as many Uber drivers. Their DUI rate went down. Their sexual assault rate went down. Their regular assault rate went down. Uh, Houston had half that amount because they do some, I didn't even know how weird that was. You can explain, it's even weirder than I thought it was. Uh, but they had half the amount of Uber drivers, but twice the population. And it doesn't make anybody safer. So the history of the background check is just that. Um, and it doesn't make us safer, I wish that it did, but there are tools out there that, that can. Great, thanks. Uh, Bill, I'm gonna switch to you right now, and, and Arthur touched on it. What exactly is wrong with background checks, and is there anything going on at the FBI, if there's inaccurate information, is there a, a process by which you can actually get these amended, where, hey, this is not me, or I've been expunged, or this is not accurate? How does that actually work, and uh, what is the issues with that? Yeah, so, um, as he indicated, a background check that is accurate is not a tool to indicate whether or not a person can positively impact a company or corporation's bottom line. It's not a predictor of future behavior, so it doesn't add to public safety by utilizing it. Um, and so companies and corporations are being hurt because there are a significant amount of people who have incredible capacity to positively impact their goals and objectives. And so now this limited pool of resources is now even more limited, as he indicated with the um, situation in Houston, but that's happening all over our country. Now, in the event that there are inaccuracies on a criminal history report, there are means and ways to actually get them accurate. But the truth of the matter is that um, these reports are generated by companies that want to generate profits. And so they're not concerned with the accuracy of the report as long as companies and institutions are purchasing these reports and making decisions. They're more interested in making sure that they have information and not concerned with whether or not the information is accurate or not. It's just as much data as I can capture about a particular individual is what's going to be um, make my services more attractive to people who are utilizing criminal records and actually utilizing them to make decisions. But one of the things that I always find amazing is that if you purchase one and you look on the bottom, there's a disclaimer that says, this should not be used to make employment decisions. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you are searching for an organization or company to actually sell you the service or product, they're promoting that this should be used 
to help you vet employees. Right. So. No, and, they, and then they owned you know, backgroundchecks.com with a Z and then with an S, and then you have to essentially buy yourself out of you know, three or four of them. It happens all the time. Um, and I know something that's big here in Texas, actually, um, we have bulk data record collections where if you go to the local, they don't actually have to update them. But if you go to DPS, which is our Department of Public and Safety, they're required to update them. So if you have inaccuracies, but the local level doesn't. So then you can have two different types of checks. One won't show up and then the other one will, depending on where you get them from. So I know that was a major topic point at the uh, legislature last session, and I think it will be this session. Um, but let's switch it back a little bit local. And Malcolm, I'll you know, kick it to you. It did seem that Uber had a system that worked successfully here. I know there was a couple complaints um, here and there, but you had you know, safe drivers, you had a reliable service, and now they're not here. And kind of, can you touch on what actually Uber was doing uh, with their background check to vet individuals to make sure that their uh, customers were safe, and why did the city council believe that their um, system was superior to that? Yeah, absolutely, and just on Arthur's point, about what happens in Houston. So Houston is the odd scenario where folks actually have to undergo private background check as well as a fingerprint face background check. So for the first 30 days of driving on the platform, they undergo the standard private background check, looks at local, state, county court records, has a seven year look back period, fairly standard for what we do across the country. After day 30, they have to undergo the FBI's fingerprint face background check, which means that the number of drivers drops off precipitously. Because for most drivers, they're doing this as part-time work or supplemental work. Most of our drivers actually drive for 10 or few hours a week. And so, as Arthur said, you're seeing increases in DUIs. You're seeing increases in the number of reported assaults. And you're also seeing higher prices for riders because there are fewer drivers on the road, which increases the price that a rider has to pay. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we're in Austin during South by Southwest and it's raining. Well, Uber actually started because of the rain. There were, our two co-founders were in Paris in 2008. They couldn't get a cab because it was raining. And it's interesting that we've seen, even just in the course of a couple of days here in Austin, how difficult it is to get a ride because of the rain without Uber being there. Um, but I, uh, Focusing specifically on what happened in Austin, um, there was a call from the city council for us to undergo uh, the FBI's fingerprint-based background check process for our drivers. We resisted it for all of the reasons Arthur mentioned, but I think there's one more that's really important to talk about, which is the discriminatory impact of this database on drivers. Most of our drivers, in fact, 60% across the United States are people of color, and who is more likely to be arrested for a crime, not charged, and not convicted? Oftentimes, resisting and evading arrest, for example, is a, char is, is, a, is a thing that certain law enforcement will use to capture people of color, particularly men of color, um, when there's otherwise not a reason to arrest them. And so we believe very strongly that the notion that you're going to use a database that does not include final dispositions when people of color are more likely to be negatively impacted by that system is fundamentally unjust. And we believe that across the country. And so interestingly, the process that we had been using in Austin with no issues is the same process we actually use all across the country. The FBI's fingerprint-based system usually has an indefinite look-back period, which means that if any point in your life you were, again, charged and or convicted, it will disbar you from getting a work opportunity. We think that doesn't make sense. Uh, the city council disagreed with us. It was put before a ballot measure, um, and the people of Austin also disagreed with us. But I think what you're seeing, and what you have seen in the ensuing year, is the negative impact that it's having on Austin. Just in the course of these couple of days, you've seen how hard it is to get around. Apparently, it was just as hard to get around during New Year's. Um, and we're hopeful that with the support of people like Senator Burton, um, we'll be able to get a bill passed uh, across the state that will uh, universalize the nature of the background check process. Um, and that's particularly important not just for Austin and San Antonio and Dallas and Houston, but also for so many of these rural areas in between big cities that don't have access to Uber at all right now who would really benefit from having Uber and other ride-sharing services available. 
Thank you. And so when we're talking about a background check on the FBI, the things that actually show up on there, and I, I don't, whoever kind of has a little bit of knowledge there. So we're talking arrests, and then we're talking, even if you get acquitted, that arrest still shows up, correct? So um, these are things that maybe you had done, got acquitted for, or charges were dropped, and they're still showing up, and they're still affecting you years, years in advance. Um, so that's something to, to think about. Um, Teresa, I kind of want to talk to you about because you have a real life story about this and you've, you've dealt with this your entire life and you deal with people right now with the work that you're doing. Um, first, if you could just kind of tell everyone your story and uh, kind of want to get touch of, you deal with people coming in from um, formerly incarcerated individuals and dealing with what they have to deal with with this and the things that you don't even think about of getting an apartment and things like that. So if you have just some, some personal stories that you could share with us and tell us a little bit about what your, um, your foundations do, it'd be okay. great. Thank you. Um, for me, I went to prison when I was 44 years old. And prior to that, I had over 20 years of professional work experience. I was an entrepreneur, a business owner. And when my the company I founded um, was investigated, I went to trial to defend both myself and the organization. I lost. And I was given an 87-month federal prison sentence. I uh, went to prison for that 87 months. Um, halfway through it, that seven years, three months, I saw someone's eyes roll in the back of their head. <laughs> so um, I went to prison and I won part of an appeal and I had it reduced by 17 months, but I served a 70 month federal prison sentence, three years of probation and did six months of a halfway house. So I get prison. Before I went to prison, what I realized was I was gonna have to repurpose myself because I knew that who I was was going to change. I had no idea how much it would really change, but I just knew enough that the things that I were, was doing, I probably wouldn't be relevant um, to do those same things. And so I went to prison working on my exit strategy, even though it was gonna be five years, 10 months before I would be able to actualize that. Since I was an entrepreneur, I went to prison, I had a captive audience, so what did I do? I studied prison. And I began to listen to the women um, who I was incarcerated with. I was at the oldest federal prison camp in the United States for women, 1,100 women in Alderson, West Virginia. And I just began hearing the stories. But I really listened intently to the stories of the women who kept coming back because those were the stories that really had some depth to it. Because what I knew from being in prison was prison life is no way of living, and no one who I met ever said, I wanna go back. So if they came back, I realized that there had to be more. But what it is, it, it's the 44,000 collateral consequences associated with having an arrest or a conviction. It's, yes, you know, the box, even though the box is really a, a silly issue because people just discriminate later um, beyond the box. And when you look at background checks as well, the background che uh, checks locks you in to a moment in time and it freezes that data and amplifies it as if it's the only thing. So if you run my background check, one, you'd have to understand the citations, you have to understand all the ways that I was my uh, original case was enhanced by a judge. You would have to understand, you know, just a lot of things that quite frankly I was charged with, I still don't even understand how all of those citations ended up on my uh, criminal record. But beyond that, what you don't get to know is that I have 30 years of professional experience, that I am a mother, that I have been a homeowner, that I am a business owner, um, I am a daughter, I am a sister, I'm a, a voter, I'm an active community member, I am a mentor, I'm a lot of things. And so the background checks, the background check in general, it doesn't humanize people. And so I think the flaw is that it doesn't tell the whole story. And so our organization, we are just trying to create a pathway to work for individuals with arrest or convictions. We are currently working on uh, a piece of technology <laughs> that
that we anticipate having ready by third quarter of this year. And it speaks to what we're talking about today. Yes, we will bring in the background check, but we want to tell the whole story of the person and package it so employers, so that uh, corporations, leasing offices can make an intelligent decision because it can't be a gut level decision from employer to employer and it's not efficient if we leave it on an employer to try to figure out is this person a good person or not? Is this person worth the risk? But ultimately what we're talking about is the right to work in this country and everyone has the right to work. And if you want smaller government, everybody needs to work. Because people who come home from prison, many of them are unable to find a job three years after they've been home from prison. And it costs too much money for us to incarcerate people. So this really just comes down to, do we want to put people back to work? And if so, then we all have to come together and to create an intelligent decision that allow people an opportunity to take care of themselves and their family. I think you hit it, yeah. I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it's a, it's a public safety issue at some point. Do we want someone with a job and housing, or do we want someone back out on the street doing you know, what they got in there for the first place? And so, I mean, I saw your ears perk up a little bit when you heard small government. Uh, <laughs> Senator Burton, yeah, so that, yes. hey, hi, yeah, so, that's me, yeah. So I think it's safe to say you're, you're a fan of the free market. Yes. And um, you know, there's been a lot of talk at the Texas legislature about um, how do we help people, you know, re-enter society after they get out, and what's the best way to do that? Sometimes um, people will suggest things that put more regulation and more burden. But I want to talk to you about just kind of what do can lawmakers do to ensure, you know, when we're talking about backgrounds and things like that. Excuse me, that we're looking at the whole picture of a someone, and you know, kind of touch on a few of the things that kind of hurt people re-entering and the things that you've dealt with on the uh, criminal justice committee. Right. So um, I want to say a few things. First and foremost, uh, when I ran for office, I certainly didn't run on criminal justice uh, it, it stuff, right? It's, no it's kind of, yeah. yeah, you know, I don't know if anyone does. Uh, but it makes so much sense. Um, you know, I am a, um, you know, I believe we are here to protect the rights of citizens. That's what lawmakers are to, d to do. And that means all of them, the fourth, the fifth, and not just the second, right? It's all of them. And of course, I'm a free market conservative. And um, so it all kind of comes together. It makes total sense that this is something that um, would interest me and that I think needs to be addressed. Um, something that I want to talk about that you know we can do at the state level is to preempt all these kind of onerous um, regulations and things that are happening at the uh, municipal levels. And something I want to go ahead and address here so that everybody understands because a lot of people don't actually because we get a lot of pushback. I get a lot of pushback when I talk about this. Um, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, you're always complaining about the federal government and how much they're imposing on the states. Yes, I am always talking about that, and it's very aggravating. Um, I always say it's a, they come up with a one-size-fits-all um, type um, policies that doesn't fit, say, Texas, for instance, but it may work in California or it may work in another state. Um, and then I turn around and say, um, you know, cities should not be doing this. So the cities and other people tend to get upset with me. They're like saying, you're being hypocritical. But I want everybody to understand I absolutely am not being hypocritical because you have to understand how it was all created. And so I think this is important for everybody to understand as you move forward um, with this is that the states were here first. The states were here first. We created the federal government. Um, and then we also created the political subdivisions in our state. So we can, we definitely can complain about the federal government overreaching, and then we can turn around and say, municipal levels, you're getting out of control. We are the ones that created you, and we can take back that control. I am for limited government personal liberties at all levels of government, and it's the state's ability, the state has that ability to keep all levels limited. So um, 
again, I, we do have the ability to preempt these onerous regulations, and, and um, we've got some bills circulating um, at the Capitol right now um, that has to do with Uber. Um, I've gone over one of them, but again, what we do best is kind of, um, you know, try to fix things by um, <laughs> creating more onerous uh, regulations. So I'm not a huge fan of the one I'm seeing right now because it kind of is more mess. Um, so, um, you know, we just need to keep it simple. We need to keep um, businesses that come in that, you know, are successful and are doing all the right things and people want to use them and people want to get jobs driving, uh, be able to, you know, there is, there is a market that's created, somebody saw it. Um, they came in, they started a company, people were able to get jobs. Um, it was a win-win-win for everybody until government stepped in and decided, you know what, we can do it better, and you know what, they can't. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I know in Texas, I think it's one-third of occupations require a license, and there's these owner's regulations. Right. I know there was a big uh, case, um, I think out of the Dallas area, where a woman was hair braiding. Right, and right. she wasn't able to do it because yes. she didn't have a cosmetology right. license, which right. takes 300 hours and $3,300 to spend. And all she was doing was literally teaching people how to hair braid, as her mother did and her grandmother. It takes longer to get, in all 50 states, you have more hours of training to be a barber than you do to be a police officer. Right. right. Carry right. a gun, you can shoot people, you That's can right. arrest people, and you have less official training than a barber. It is outrageous. Right. Those are a lot of things that we're looking at. All 50 states. More than happy last session to um, co-author with Senator West um, on that in the Senate, on the hair braiding bill. Right. Um, and we got that passed. That was one of my, that's the funnest thing for me to talk about during the interim. I mean, a lot of people just don't know about this. I didn't know about it until I was an elected official. I mean, you, unless you're involved in that particular um, trying to get that license and that kind of thing. But right now, there, um, there's Representative Goldman in the House. There was a study, not this past interim, but the one before that, that showed all the occupational licensing, you know, uh, the over, just the ones that were onerous and we don't even need licenses for. I mean, interior designer, do you necessarily need a, a license for that, right? Um, I mean, these kinds of things make it hard for people who have talent to go out necessarily and do it. I mean, if you've got talent and somebody wants to hire you, why not let it happen? I mean, if they're not good, they're not gonna last long, right? The market's gonna make that decision for it. So um, to me, it's the easiest way um, for, to allow people to get to work. And the more we put these uh, obstacles and hurdles in place, the less um, able they're gonna be able to do it. Right. Yeah, I know we were um, teaching people how to be barbers in, in prison, and then uh, if you had a felony conviction on your background, then you weren't able to get a barber right. license. Right. And so, right. um, yeah, you're teaching this great occupation for someone to get to rise out, and then, oh, sorry, no, uh, the government's gonna tell you that you can't do that anymore. Um, we have about, I think, 15 minutes. I'd love to kind of kick it to the audience to see if there's any questions. If you do have one, there's a uh, mic right there, and here we go. <laughs> I think she has one. Go she might, yeah. It wasn't about wanting to uh, impart regulations onto these companies. It was about making a fair <coughs> playing field between Uber and Lyft and the taxi companies. And so I feel like the, where that came into play is at the state level where we've already got these onerous regulations on the taxi companies. So instead of fighting Austin for to be able to do what Uber and Lyft wanted to do, why didn't we go to the state and say, hey, this is really crazy. We need to lengthen some of these regulations so that people can have jobs instead of creating this really strange uh, map and web throughout the state. And so um, I want to know what we're doing to create the less regulation um, 
statewide, and I also want to say that um, this local control thing is, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and also, like, we fought really hard for that pure chance hiring ordinance in Austin, and we're being threatened at the state level for them to undo it because they see uh, the need for businesses to have more liberty than individuals, and I think that there's something, there's a disconnect there. So I agree that bad policy for taxi drivers is the same as bad policy for Uber. Yep. So in an ideal world, yep. taxi drivers would not undergo the FBI's fingerprint background checks because it doesn't make sense for them. If it's discriminatory for Uber drivers, it's also discriminatory for taxi drivers. But insofar as we can do things to lessen those barriers or remove some of those occupational licensing efforts, uh, we're trying to do that in states. And so one of the things that we did last year in California is we actually aligned our driver screening process around a statewide ballot measure that passed called Proposition 47, which called for the reclassification of a number of low-level, non-violent offenses from felonies to misdemeanors. It made sense, it passed by a 60 to 40 margin. You had folks on the left like you know, Jay-Z, you had folks on the right like Newt Gingrich, right, in Op-Ed saying it was good, good policy. You don't get more Strange bipartisan. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you know it must be good policy. Um, and what we've seen in, in, in the data that we've looked at is six months into the, uh, the changes, we had 3,300 drivers on the platform. Half of those folks were actually out on the road taking trips. And importantly, their ratings were actually marginally higher than the average ratings across the state of California. And so in conversations about what businesses can do, there's a big question about how you make clear that there's a really strong business proposition around lessen lessening these barriers. And we have data to show that it makes business sense. Every driver gets rated after every single trip they take. And if they're doing better when, they have get, when they've been given this additional opportunity, then that's a real signal and an indication that we should be doing things like this elsewhere. So after we made the changes in California, we made them in a handful of other states, Rhode Island, Mississippi, Connecticut. Um, but one of the reasons we haven't made them in more states is because there are onerous licensing requirements in place that make it very difficult for us to change the driver screening process. So we hope to be able to do some of those changes that we've made in those initial states elsewhere, Texas among them. Um, but again, it means getting rid of some of the barriers that don't make sense for Uber drivers or taxi cab drivers. And this goes, this goes further than just the free market and giving people opportunities. There, there are people who get, get their PhDs looking at these types of issues. And there is empirical evidence that shows that if you have a job, not only are you much less likely to commit a crime, but on the metrics that we can look at parenting, you are a better parent for the, for the ones that we can measure. You are much less likely to commit a crimes against other people because you are invested in the community. And something that I, anybody knows me, they've heard this sentence because it's like, a, like I should put it on a t-shirt or something. But I, I think it's, it always surprises me that we have disenfranchised a generation of Americans and they're so surprised when they don't want to participate in the system. And you know what, what Bill was talking about, when Teresa was talking about, when I say I'm okay with a certain amount of background checks, I do not want a rapist driving my, sister, my, my wife to school. I'm, I'm fine with that type of determination. But I don't care if you robbed a bank, and I don't know what you went to jail for, but I'm pretty sure I'm comfortable you driving me to the, the, the airport. It, it, it is probably a. <laughs> it is, it is, it is, it is <laughs> there are so many levels to this debate that we have to be thinking about. And there is a certain amount of dignity to work I was out of work for three months and I went crazy. It, it, it drove me insane. I felt like a, a less of a man because I, I didn't have a job. And it truly is something about, that lowers all these numbers that I'm, that I'm talking about. You will commit less crime if you have a job because you're invested in the system. And I think that on the left, you and I talked about this last night, on the left, they need to stop sticking their nose up about what kind of job is right for you. If you want to drive for Uber, fine, drive for Uber. It's, it isn't that freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, so I think that this is, this is a gigantic ball uh, that all moves together. I want to um, piggyback on what both gentlemen have just put forward. Um, and I also want to make sure that we take some time and attempt to identify bad actors. Um, Arthur issued that it's crazy what it is that we're doing, but no one's addressed why we are doing what we are doing. Who was it that lobbied legislators to actually implement fingerprinting in addition to the background checks that were already being utilized? Those are the people who actually own 
fingerprinting background companies. Here it is, Uber surprise, driving surprise. millions yeah. of people, right, <laughs> into getting these background checks, and they're just like, wait, we have to capitalize on these opportunities as best we can. So let's make sure that we get lobbyists, hire them, and indicate that we need 50 additional dollars for each individual that Uber is already driving to us as our customer base. And those are the individuals who are driving this madness where we're further utilizing something crazy. Um, I, I, don't, I guess I didn't raise it, but I served six and a half years in prison for robbery, kidnapping, criminal conspiracy, and violation of the Uniform Firearms Act in 1993, and I was released from prison in 2000. Today, in Philadelphia, where I reside, I can't drive for Uber. I was denied. Although our local government had put a protection in that said, you can't look past seven years, and if you look for a period of seven years, you see nothing. So these regulations are having a profound negative impact on people who have served their time, who owe nothing to our society in terms of being punished, this punitive punishment this culture of discrimination aimed at people living with the rest and convictions when there are 70 to 100 million of us is utterly ridiculous. And we need to identify the bad actors. We need to um, be open to providing people with the opportunity to not live perpetually punished. Because uh, Brian Stevens says all the time that um, we, so what'd you say? Um, each of us are greater than the worst thing that we have ever done. And so as she indicated, that moment that you freeze, where I committed that offense at 23 years old and now I'm a 47 year old man with an incredible amount of positive work and who's a contributing taxpayer and a member of my community who makes significant investments that positively impact it. This can happen over and over and over again to the tunes of millions of times. And that's something that our country needs in order to be able to compete in a global economy today. Absolutely. Senator Byrne, I think you had something that you want to say. Yeah, I just wanted to add, too, in addition to the companies that you were um, talking about that has have the background checks that may be lobbying to keep, right? I, I didn't see that so much. Uh, I don't know. But one of the things that I want to impress upon everybody is the taxi, at least, I don't know, all of them, but generally, the taxi cab services were not looking to um, lower their regulations. <laughs> they were looking to make Uber's regulations as high as theirs because they know that they couldn't exist in that kind of environment and who does that help? The taxi cab services. So I'm talking generally now, I'm not talking about every specific company out there, but something you need to be aware of is this happens a lot at the, at the Capitol. It's called protectionism and um, those Bigger businesses, um, sometimes, some of them will come in and say, no, 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 we need these kind of regulations. We need this because they know that the startups can't handle it. Um, and they want to, and that's why you call it protectionism, because they, wanna, they want to have this so that the competition keeps suppressed. So they use government to help them succeed in business, and it makes me nuts. I want, I, and I know exactly what they're saying when they come in, they all kind of, you know, uh, have this flowery language, to some, you know, like it's something that it's not. Um, I want all businesses, regardless of size, to be on an even playing field. That doesn't mean to raise up regulations, that means to lower them if they don't need to be there. Right, absolutely. Yeah, um, can I, I jump in? Just oh, sure, quick? please, yes. I think it's important, too, to just kind of double down on what Bill was saying is when we're talking about 70 to 80 million people with an arrest or conviction, we live together. We are in the same community. I know I've talked to Malcolm when I was trying to understand who can drive for Uber, what are the laws, the rules, state by state, this, that, the other. But I thought, well, this is interesting because in an Uber car, can be someone who has an arrest or conviction. They just can't be behind the wheel driving and earning the money. I, can be a customer I for ride sure. with because Uber all the time. It's been a lot and of money I said with to him, I said, well, you guys do know we're in the car. You know, so like, <laughs> why, why are we not allowed behind the wheel? Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, I think that you're um, very, oh, is there a question? I'm sorry. I would like to ask a question. Oh, please, come up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Step right in. Yeah. <laughs> 
in two days. For me, I think if we're going to shift culture, and I know Bill's going to jump in right behind me, <laughs> is it's something that I think is actually crazy. We have to rehumanize humans. Period. Like, I never stopped being a human being. I never stopped being a mother while I was in prison, a sister, a daughter. When I went to prison inside of the community, I became a good community member inside of that place. But today, Uber can't do the work for me. They have to partner with me and allow me to t show my face, to tell my story. My daughter is here, Lauren. And I take her places because when we go places, people have a hard time believing her mother went to prison. And when she says, oh, a family member went to prison and that's why we started the business, unfortunately, they think, oh, it must have been her father. And she says, oh, no, it's my mom, that lady. That's the one that went to prison. So we have to not make it so scary. And we have to remember that your children are in school with kids whose parents are in prison inside of your church. We don't talk about it. My daughter says individuals don't go to prison, families do. So we have incarcerated today 2.3 million families that are currently sitting inside of a prison. Their families are incarcerated, and their shame in talking about it. Who among us want to say, oh, yeah, I have someone, in, you know, my cousin, my mother, my sister, my brother. But that is what we have to do. So we need to be a part of what's happening in the state legislature, in corporations. And we have voice, and we have platform, and we need to speak for ourselves. We need to build the technology and, and so forth. And their movements are growing up. I have to give a shout out to Andrea James, who's sitting over there. She's um, the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. I'm a part of her organization as well. But there is a movement of directly impacted people who want to help shift the culture. Yeah, um, of course I'm going to piggyback on that response, right? <laughs> so the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but usually furthest from the resources and power. Mm -hmm. What Teresa just indicated is that um, our stories, but not only our stories, um, the 70 to 100 million American, among us we say that we need to come out of the closet. There are individuals who are sitting in the audience who have arrest records. Sometimes you haven't thought about that you were in college and you got pulled over by a police officer and you had a can of beer or something transpired because some people have a different level of privilege in our country. But the truth of the matter is, is that we've been able to ignore this problem and we can no longer ignore it. It's costing us too much financially. As a result, we are hiring police officers and correction officers and prosecutors <coughs> and judges, but we're no longer hiring teachers. We have prisoners because we invest in prisons. So our responsibility is for me to sit in front of you and to make an impression upon your heart and mind and then to tell you later on that I served time in Pennsylvania state prisons for kidnapping. It creates a juxtaposition in your existence. You're not supposed to be able to hear me, to listen to me, to feel like you should be in relationship with me. And so we're doing a great job of making sure that we're available to tell our stories, and it's a very difficult thing to do, to make sure that we assert ourselves in leadership positions in corporate America, in government, um, in the private sector, to ensure that these people with this lived experience who know the way to transform people's hearts and minds can actually lead a movement where everybody realized that going to prison in America is normal. 70 
to 100 million of us. It's normal. And we have to stop treating people abnormally, particularly when we think about all the drivers of mass incarceration. If we're going to say that these communities are over-policed, hypercriminalization of behavior, black and brown people are targeted more than any other populations, and then we're going to perpetually punish these individuals because of the way that the system responded to them. Not whether or not they committed an offense. I, the first panel had so many conflicts as language is being used and truths were being put forward that were all just kind of sort of a mishmash of untruths or inaccuracies or solid truths. Um, you know, at some point we call a person an offender. We, at some point we say a person is a violent offender. Well, yeah, you know what? Um, cop pulls me over, then it's, if I don't really do something, he is going to say that I resisted arrest. And that is going to be classified as a violent offense. And then I am going to be determined to be an offender. And I am going to have a criminal history. And I never committed a crime. How frequently has that happened? But yet we have these laws and these regulations that say it's OK to discriminate against this person because he's been in conflict with the criminal justice system. We have it all wrong. And so it's incumbent upon us to actually change that. And so we're committed to doing the work. And we know that lots of individuals across our country are beginning to do the work. But I challenge each person here to measure what you feel and what you believe a criminal is. Yeah, Senator Burton, kind of touching on police contacts, I know that's something that you've discussed quite a bit. And you have a, uh, a bill out there if you wanted to kind of briefly talk about that where we um, are jailing people for, you know, when they actually can't go to jail for the offense. And I know that's something that you've discussed, so if you want to enlighten us. Um, y yeah, are you talking about the non-jailable yes. offenses one? Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, if it's a, uh, if you're getting pulled over and it's a non-jailable offense, um, you shouldn't have to go to jail for that. And so this is something that we're, uh, we actually want to uh, make it into law. Um, and the police officer, once they pull you over, needs to notify you of that. Um, you know, we want to, we know that, a lot of police officers, you know, work to de-escalate situations, but we want to try to help that as well at um, the state level. Um, and one of those ways, and I, this, it's going to take some time because I'm doing a lot of educating um, at the Capitol with my fellow Republicans. I think that I, I say this a lot. I think there was, well, I don't know, I think there was a day when it was kind of a lock them up and throw away the key kind of mentality, right? Um, and it's, it's turning, it's turning. It's not there for everyone yet, but it's getting there. I mean, there's a lot of legislation, particularly on the Senate side, we do a lot of things behind the scenes. We're not so much the like the House where you're debating things right out in front of everyone, so you don't always see it. But there's a lot of legislation that we've already been very successful in getting um, criminal penalties out of because it's just kind of commonplace thinking for a lot of the legislators. You know, they'll say things like, um, and I get it. I, I, they're not trying, they're not trying to be these bad people to jail everybody. That's just their kind of mentality of, okay, we've got this law, now we need to put some teeth into it, right? That's kind of how they think about it. We need to put some teeth into it. We've got to have a kind of a, this, you know, a way to make it something, you know? And, and, you know, then you start explaining to them, okay, this is, there was, I won't go into the details of the law, but it's basically a paperwork error <laughs> kind of uh, legislation that, you know, uh, could potentially put you in jail, right? And, and you just, you have to point this out to them and they go, oh yeah, right? And so it just, we're doing a lot of that behind the scenes of making people realize that, um, you know, if it's a non-violent offense, I think there's different ways of going, you know, about it as well as not always passing, you know, not passing more laws that will get you arrested. Um, and I want to ask you all to do the same thing, too. When there is something that makes you mad or angry, don't immediately say, we need to have a law. Um, one of the things, right, and it, this comes from the individual people out there, too. We got to have a law for that, and they need to be thrown in jail. Um, one of the things, and this is kind of self-interest here, but I'm going to mention, um, texting while driving. We all agree nobody should be texting while driving, don't we? Well, if we get a texting while driving ban on the books for the whole state, okay, you know how hard it is to determine for a police officer to determine whether you are texting, are you looking at your map, are you just looking at your time, are you looking at what? 
It is, it is a very hard, you can't just say, you know, determine that they're texting. Well, we're going to be pulling, the police are going to be pulling more people over, aren't they? So all of, the, and there's many people out there I fight with all the time on this. I would much rather phone companies um, or whoever, you know, nonprofits uh, uh, come together, um, do, you know, come out with some sort of campaign that teaches people what happens if you text and drive. I think that's much more worthy than another dadgum law in the books that could give police officers another reason to have to pull you over. Um, you know, it's, it's much akin, I think y'all probably seen them, they were so incredible, I mean, it was, I don't know who it was, but the, the um, commercials on TV where they're driving and they're just talking to their little girl, the mom's talking to her little girl, and out of the blue, I think she says she's going to text, and out of the blue a horrific crash happens. To me, that is much more substantive than another law in the books that creates more tension um, between, you know, our law enforcement and people that are just wanting to go to work or go to their job or whatever because, you know, they pulled them over because they were looking at their phone. So it's something for everybody as individuals to think about as well. Um, when you're frustrated with something, don't just think we need to have another law. And currently in Texas, if you have a text mail driving ban, now that you're pulled over, you can get jailed for that. Uh, right. Exactly. And then right. they can search your car and right. forfeit your proceeds of the, uh, yeah, so, so it all, yeah, it you all need to think back. about it all the way around. Exactly. I just wanted to address that question of how do we make that cultural change from the perspective of, yeah. of a company. Um, very quickly, yeah. I cannot tell you how many times I am in conversations with folks from other companies who say, we're doing this work, we're actually giving opportunities to people with criminal records, but they don't want to talk about it. They are scared to talk about it, they're fearful of the PR backlash. The truth is, if you work at a company that's doing this work, Get out there and tell your story. That's the only way that other companies are going to jump on board. Great. Arthur, you had something. I have two plugs, actually. Um, and actually, pick it back. The tech, going all the way back to this whole reason, tech is one of the ways that we can do that. One of the, the things that Viri does that I love that uh, Rick was talking about on this first panel is that one of the most humiliating things about being in prison is after you get out and you go to work and you have people show up with badges to harass you at work because it's part of being on, on probation. And there's ways that technology can fix that and give you dignity back with work. Two things I want to plug because we sponsored this. One, <laughs> there is a, we have a, a report coming out called uh, Right Score. It is systematic, it is detailed, it is empirical that lays out everything dealing with ride sharing state by state, jur jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and it tells you, we grade them, we give them a grade, and it tells you s specifically what uh, that your jurisdiction's problems are. Uh, Ian in the back can tell you more about it, he helped draft it. The second thing is, uh, our street is starting a coalition called the Justice for Work Coalition, and it is specific to this whole issue of you should have the opportunity to work. A company should be able to make the determination uh, based on a risk analysis of who they want to hire. And we really believe that th this is going to be solved. The cultural change we keep talking about, it has to come from the left and right. So this is a left-right coalition that is designed to have people talk about it. And if you guys live in D.C., we're going to have an event in about a month. Great. Um, I feel we could talk for another two hours with this panel. Thank you all so much for being up here. You guys are great.